Without further ado, I would like to call up the next person. So this next person is somebody with a very bright future. Someone we're all going to keep our eyes on because they have very big shoes to fill. Not only are her parents really intelligent, great business people, really good looking, um, but now her dad's written a book and she's going to come up and she's going to tell us all about it. Please, ladies and gentlemen, won't you help me please welcome Biana Akpokabayan. Come, Biana, don't be shy. So Biana's going to tell us all about her dad. How are you, my darling? Wait, quick five-second interview before we do this. How are you? I'm good. You realize that if I take off my heels, we're probably the same height. How old are you? Um, I'm turning 13. That's shameful. I'm like twice your age. <laughs> What are you feeding this child? So, Biana, are you nervous? Yes. You're nervous? Yes. Biana, tell me the truth. Did your dad tell you what to say about him? No. Are you sure? Yes. Don't worry, girl. He'll still pay your school fees. <laughs> the floor's all yours, my darling. Please help me welcome Biana. Good evening, everybody. I am Biana Apokabain. The author of this book is my dad, Ikos Apokabain. He is an inspiration to many people, especially to my siblings and I. He brings out the best in us. We're so proud of him for writing this book. Without further ado, I present to you the author of the book, Ikos Apokabain. Good evening, everybody. Uh, first, I'd like to thank everyone here. I can see all the smiles, and um, it's giving me a lot of joy. Um, start, standing on the existing protocol, uh, permit me, I'm going to read my speech. But I most um, recognize His Excellency the Consul General of the Federal Republic of Nigeria to South Africa, Mr. Godwin Adama. I would also like to recognize distinguished Senator Baba Femi Ojudu, a special advisor to the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. You're welcome. I would like to recognize Professor John Tesha. He's the executive secretary of the Forum of the Former African Presidents. He's here representing His Excellency, the first president of Zambia. You're welcome. I recognize Mr. Anthony Ogbe, he is in charge of consular matters in the consulate of, the, of Johannesburg. You're welcome, sir. I recognize also on the high table the chief launcher of today. He is the president of the Nigerian Doctors Forum. You're welcome. Permit me, I will see recognize some people on my speech. I think this is a very wonderful and honorable day. I heard people saying they came here because of me, thank you. But I think more you are coming here because of the African people and the plight of our struggle for a better future. <clears throat> 
Today is a good and blessed day as we are all gathered here for this book launch and an opportunity to ponder more ideas to strengthen and improve Africa as a whole. I will first of all start by giving thanks in no special order. I thank God Almighty for all he has done in my life, giving me the strength and ability to be who I am as a person in today's world. I would like to thank my wonderful wife who has been a strong pillar of support in my life, bearing us three of the best kids any parents will wish to have. Taking care of our home on many occasions, I've been absent attending various functions and meetings to enhance change. Omotayo, you will always be loved by me and I thank you so dearly. I also like to thank His Excellency Dr. Kenneth Kaunda, the first president of Zambia, for being an inspiration to me and many Africans, for what he stood for and for writing the forward of this book. I would like to thank His Excellency, the Nigeria High Commissioner to South Africa, Mr. Kabiru Bala, especially for his words of encouragement to me. And his words of wisdom rings ever true. He said to me, when you do good, you will need money to advertise your good deed. But when you do bad, everyone gets, everyone gets free publicity. I thank His Excellency, the Nigerian Consul General to South Africa, Mr. Godwin Adama. Since your arrival to South Africa, you have made tremendous and immediate positive impact. Your tenacity and love for the ordinary Nigerian has shown through your service to all. In your words, you assured me that you will be here for Nigerians, no matter what, and so it is. I thank the special advisor to the Federal Republic of, to the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, distinguished Senator Baba Femi Ojudu for coming all the way from Nigeria, despite his many engagement to honor this invitation. You have been very special to me. Your life struggles for the downtrodden and your personal sacrifice for our democracy cannot be overlooked. I feel so blessed knowing you. I would like to thank um, the chief launcher, Dr. Emeka Ugu. I'm not going to waste so much time, but you know how I feel about you. I'd like to thank Mr. Anthony Ogbe. I'd like to thank Chief Amadi Obi Amadi. He's put all effort as the chairman of the organizing committee to make sure this day was a success. I'd like to thank Valentino Ali. He's also the publisher, he's part of the organizing committee. I'd like to thank my dear friend Ayodela Kunle. Uh, they just read my biography, thank you so much. I thank Sandra O'Hare who put the flowers and made sure this place was decorated. The voice, Olani Abodedele, Prince Adedepo Adesami, Tunji Omotola, uh, Bernard Okene, Uche Johnson, Prince Ike, Mr. Anthony Anakwe, my partner, who came all the way from the United Kingdom to attend this event, my pastors, Pastor Matthew, Onowu, I thank you, the traditional leaders here, Dr. Ben Okoli, uh, the media channels, NDTV, Betty, I thank you so much for coming here, my PDP family, and the Nigerian community. And the quest for a better life and greater opportunity, I've been privileged to travel around the world and see for myself firsthand the state of many nations. I was blessed to live in the same city as one of the greatest human beings of our time, Nelson Mandela. Last month, we celebrated Mandela Day, which is recognized by United Nations. And as usual, I did my 67 minute service for humanity. Nelson Mandela taught me resilience and true reconciliation, especially with oneself. Another icon that inspired me is a descendant of West African slave from Jamaica, Marcus Garvey, who in the 19th century said, as Africans, we should open our minds, for God never intended for one race to be superior to the other, or for black people to live in poverty and despair. He also said, God has given all man a just mind to acquire knowledge. In knowledge and understanding lies the greatness of a man. Also, Martin Luther King Jr. taught me to use my voice for the greater good of my people. So when I met His Excellency, Dr. Kenneth Kaunda, the first president of Zambia, I knew for sure that I must write this book to continue the echoes of the black hero's past and to establish the work of a better life for Africans in the future. This was confirmed three years ago 
when I attended a conference of panel of nine former African head of states. And I realized that there was a lot of disconnection between the future leadership and the past. So much has been done in the past to get us to where we are presently. And we must appreciate this without psychophancy so we can genuinely embrace our today in order to see the continuity of aligned progress of our future. This book is basically about Pan-Africanism and our leadership history and progress. It is also a max especially to engage future African leaders. I have looked at African historical progress and political leadership over several areas up till the present and I've compiled this into one book for easy read and with proposed solution to identify problems. I would like to refer to inspirational guidance of one of Africans father of Pan-Africanism, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, as quoted from my book. The Nkrumah Doctrine. The vision I see, in that vision I see a paraphrase, and upon that paraphrase I see the mother of African unity and independence. Her body besmeared with blood of the benighted of the race. On the same paraphrase, I see the heroes of the race, both living and dead, in unison, singing one national anthem. On that paraphrase, I see cities in Africa springing up, becoming metropolis of art and learning and science and philosophy. And I hear beyond that paraphrase, mortals resounding and rejoiners, seek ye first the political kingdom and liberty and all other things will be added unto it. In another speech, can it, in another speech Dr. Kwame Krumah said, I have never regarded the struggle of the independence of the Gold Coast as an isolated object, but always as a part of the general world historical pattern. Africans of all territory of this vast continent shall wake up and nothing shall stand in the way of their fight for freedom. It is our duty since we constitute the vanguard to give all possible assistance to those currently waging battles that we have put on the right track. Our tax is not done and our safety is not secured until the last of colonialism are eliminated from the African continent." Unquote. I have pondered within myself, and I must add that often my mind has bored with passion, and I each with desires to do things for my beloved Africa, to make it great again. Most times I feel hopeless, then I feel hopeful, then confused not knowing what to do or who to turn to. I often ask God why. However, with much study research and appreciative thinking, I have come to an understanding of fact that I can proudly say has got to me to the state of absolutely comprehension of the whole situation. I will add here that deep thinking is not bad at all, and also asking questions that seems to have no answer has always been a part of humanity since the beginning of civilization. This did not start with me and will not end with me. We must think and ask questions about problems of our time. The Greek philosophers, Pluto and Socrates, were great thinkers and used their mind to ask deep questions and solve problems of their time. Today, we tap into those philosophies. Through deep thinking and trying to know, we eventually get answers and, bring, and, and this brings about knowledge which facilitates the right decision and questions about ourselves, our life, and the continent. As Pluto said, a good decision is based on knowledge and not on numbers. The thinking and using the mind appropriately to get results is important and the right thing to do. We must think, and I'm proud that I'm, I'm always thinking. Since 2007, global leaders have declared that Africa is the next best thing and the place for investment and double digit growth. For me, I say Africa is the new best thing and not the next best thing. We can make our future happen rather now than later. What does the future life for Africa, and most importantly, Nigeria and South Africa? Permit me to go back into history and use the power of our mind and knowledge to descend our past, to know where we are now and where we should be going. Our continent has been called the dark continent. What does this mean and what does it refer to? Is it because of lack of electricity or common black magic practices or because we are blacks in skin color? The earlier civilization started from Africa, so what happened? I became obsessed to know why we are in our present state. Sometimes I even think it is a cause that, we are placed, that was placed on Africa. Early civilization started here. Through my research, I came to realize that because of the position of African early man, found it very conducive to live and stay in Africa. Like every normal human challenges, there were conflicts and competition for resources. And of course, there were factions and people were also divided due to acceptable and unacceptable lumps. Laws and tradition of early man. This was happening in Africa and everyone was here. Those that broke the laws and challenged the belief of the early man in Africa had to be banished. 
Please know that this is not a personal theory, but simply research and thinking as well as reference from scholarly historians and archaeologists. I didn't come to this conclusion just on my own. This is based on research and documented evidence. So as I was saying, for various reasons, certain people had to leave Africa to faraway places, while others were banished for transgressions. The early Africans stayed and continued to control their resources and live their life as they knew it. Early Africans did not need to go too far to find food, animals to hunt or water to drink, as weather condition was good, shelter was easy, and medicine was also accessible. To me, it seemed this was the place to be at the time. Imagine if you were banished or not here in Africa. You would certainly look for a visa to get back in order to enjoy the resources that was known to man. Unfortunately, over time, because of the natural location and endowment, early African man did not need to think too deeply. Those in other places of the world, like Europe, who were descendants of the banished, realized that things were very difficult in their new location. The weather changed too quickly seasonally. Shelter was hard to come back, come by, as well as medicine. They had to think fast, think deeply, if they had to survive. They were mostly known as barbarians and could not settle down at a place due to extreme cold of the region. It also was not easy to hunt. In fact, because of the harsh condition, humans were being hunted by animals. Constant movement was then the norm and deep thinking. This became their tool until this day and led to the dominance of the world. As the barbarians moved around for survival, they would invade lands, fight the inhabitants, acquire their food, properties, and then move on to another place to conquer. Of course, there were areas they met resistance, but generally their harsh living lives had made them conquerors. Constant movement quickly made them discover their weaknesses and their strength. Remember, all this took hundreds of years to happen. On the African continent, however, there was no movement. Strictly speaking, there was no need for movement, as all, need, all they needed to survive was in Africa. This lack of movement did not enhance our thinking and our ability to interact, so we gradually became isolated. You will see what happened as time went on. I would not like to go back too far back in time, but we start about 15,000 years ago. Europe, Middle East, and North, Northern part of Africa started to interact because of the movement I mentioned and deep thinking. They started to develop technologies that were enable them to move and travel. This allowed them to travel within their region and they developed more tools that were necessary to survive. These early deep thinkers started developing weapons and tools that were enable them to move freely and acquire properties. As time went on, philosophy emerged and questions were asked about our existence and the essence of all things. Thinking started bringing new ideas and solving difficult problems at the time, towards creating advancement and development. Because of the comfort of Africa, we were excluded from this discussion, and deep thinking started taking place at the time. Anyway, strong weapons were developed, and constant battle for supremacy and control of resources was the order of the day. At times, peace was made and resources of the world shared among themselves. Africa, of course, was excluded. Hundreds of years passed, thinking advanced, and thinkers started to dream. People speculated this world was big and there was more out there. Asia was discovered, colonized, and it became the new place to fight for resources. However, it was very far and quite difficult to get to, particularly by sea. These early thinkers were so scared to come to other parts of Africa apart from the north because of its vast forests and the fear of the unknown. They thus referred to it as the dark continent. In fact, this was the first time the dark, dark was used. Anyway, the next level of travelers decided that there should be an easier way to get to the Far East or Asia. But they ended up in America. America then became the new place to battle for resources. By now, these European explorers were more experienced and decided that this time around they would teach those they conquer and colonize their language. Eventually, they started advancing in their thinking and devised ways of manipulation and control and rulership. Africa was not included in all of this. After the discovery and colonization of other regions of the world, Africa became the next region in their sight. Expedition began to Africa, and soon these Europeans discovered the abandoned natural resources in Africa, and the rush to plunder the continent began. Although, Africa, although the Africa that the returning Europeans met was rich in natural resources, bronze, steel, and artifact, we never developed this into sophisticated weapon of war. But the Europeans, by their wandering experience and endless battle have become expert at making weapons. They had also discovered gunpowder in Asia and learned how to use it, how to use this in their guns. So when the battle for Africa happened, there was a vengeance to it because of their forebearers we banished. So they did not only conquer our land but took our artifact, destroyed our culture and traditions and their form of and our form of education and removed our able body 
class men as slaves to work in foreign lands and conquered our minds. Now that we have had a deep peep into our history, we all should understand that we will never know where we are going if we do not know where we are coming from. I find it very painful that the modern generation most, most times forget that we as a people or race came from somewhere and that that history is important. Certain seeds have been planted in us by our parents and most things we do are influenced by those seeds and environment in which we find ourselves. So there's basically nothing new in what we are doing now, save for the fact that we are carrying on a legacy we do not know whether it is ours or part of the seed planted in us. I intend to go directly, but it will be important to steer your mind to a pure understanding of my thought. The same goes to our African current generation. We have hardly understood where we are coming from and have limited our past or undermined it. This is a time to go in depth and be faithful with our facts, to see what has been planted in us by our, few, by our history from Africans and non-Africans, and really what we need, really what needs to be weeded out. To be direct, there is good news. As a mathematician, I can tell you that before you solve any mathematical problem, you must first be able to understand the questions and know the problems to be solved. There is no way one can solve a problem without knowing he or she has a problem. We as Africans in our current generation have been pondering and trying to know what is our problem and why we are at the lowest scale of development in our world today. Knowing the why to these questions can prove us with the appropriate willpower and knowledge to put an end to the African problem. Of course, this cannot happen in one day overnight. It will take time for sure but it will start with a single spark of awareness, a single glow of knowledge in truth based on our past and readiness to grow from previous weaknesses and failure. Even the current non-African among us are aware of this new African insight that is better on consciousness of progress and renaissance. This is not the time to blame others or be aggrieved about our history and our occurrence of the past. However, if we are determined to change our future and become equal partners in world affairs, we have to take positive experiences from our past for the development of the future. This is possible and it can start with you and I. No one race, nation or people can continue to be dominate, dominate or rule the world forever. Naturally, there will be a change beyond human control or imagination. And this can come from either true natural disasters or true human folly. But we humans have the power to make the change come more positive and beneficial to all without personal greed and selfishness. Some of what I've revealed in my book, The African Progress Initiative, might be termed secrets by some and outrageous by others, but they are based on history. Are they based on archaeological facts? Are they based on well-founded research and in-depth insight? The answer to all this is a resounding yes. To explain better my ideological direction in this book, I quote here from the conclusion I wrote in it. The crowning glory of this book in its inherent hope in progress and growth for Africa. Despite all Africa has been through, this book highlights progress and a rebirth of the African Renaissance. Here I introduce my ideology, suggested concepts that can help African leaders in realizing this necessary progress initiative. The African Progress Initiative, the new best thing, is exactly that. A new best way to look at Africa's historical and political landscape through French lessons and somewhat radical, if not at times controversial, insight. I have not missed words here. I have told it as it is through my own lens and backed by years of research and references. African Progress Initiative, the new best thing, is about change of our mindset and embracing love to act and implement the technological and ideological solution I have proposed. No one has the right to suppress our voice and our ideas to see a prosperous Africa. For me, I will continue to add value to Africa and do more, rather than to keep complaining and doing nothing. As I end this speech, I would like to appreciate some of our African leaders. Dr. Unamdi Azikiwe, Patrice Lulum Lulumba, Kenneth Kaunda, Obafemi Awolo, Thomas Sankara, Amadu Bello, Oliver Tambo, Samora Michel, Abat Lituli, Julius Nere, Halasi Selassie, Walter Sisulu, Nelson Mandela. We thank you for what you have been and contributed to this African continent. I finish this speech with these words. Remember when you eat a fruit, think of the person who planted it. 
a wise man knows he knows nothing. God bless the land of Africa. God bless the people of Africa. God bless Africa. Thank you. Mr. Jackson Osuafo, you're very welcome this evening. Thank you very much for joining us. Now, coming up next from our esteemed high table is a guest that I'm always happy to see. He has been humble enough and serious enough to come to events that mean a lot to Nigeria and to Nigerians. I've seen him at various events, giving up his time, um, showing how serious his people are and taking his post very seriously. The honorable, very honorable, Mr. Godwin Adama. He's visible and he's here tonight and he's going to give us a speech. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everybody. I want to first of all appreciate the author of the book that we are here tonight to launch, the African Progress Initiative by Ecos Akpakobayemi. Representative of Kenneth Kanda, first and former president of Zambia, and Senator Babafemi Ojodu, senior, the special advisor to the president, you can also see my colleague, Mr. Anthony Ogbe, Minister in Charge of Consular and Immigration, Consulate General of Nigeria in Johannesburg. And also, Dr. Emeka Ugu, great Nigerian leaders in South Africa here present, distinguished Nigerians, ladies and gentlemen. I count it a great pri privilege to be here this evening on the launch of a book, The African Initiative, The Best, The New Best Thing. <laughs> you, can, you can say more amen to that. Amen. I've accepted to be part of this event due to the personality of this great Nigerian patriot and a great communicator. I fully identify with his leadership qualities and the sense of patriotism to a national cause. When he told me he was writing a book of this nature, I encouraged him to finalize and obey the book for the sake of African unity and cooperation. I wish to use this opportunity to apologize on behalf of the High Commissioner, Ambassador Kabiru Bala, who is currently in Nigeria and may only be arriving back later today or tomorrow. He had wanted to be here, but due to pressing national duties, unavailable today, but here in spirit. He also identifies with this noble cause, being a principal representative of Nigeria in South Africa. The book, The African Progress Initiative, The New Best Thing, signifies the relevance of African unity at a time like this. Going through the book, one would appreciate the experience and political sagacity of the author. I've watched this Nigerian deliver papers in some forums, and I could not but praise his level of commitment to a common cause and scholarship. His eloquence and power of presentation is excellent. His focus on African unity and progress cannot be better appreciated than now when Africa appears to be having political and economic challenges. As, great, as a great foremost African nationalist, like former President Kaunda would want to see, Africa needs a formidable political way to assert itself within the Committee of Nations. The author's research is therefore a must read for everyone here and others that are not present here tonight. The Freedom Charter initiated by the Organization of African Unity in 1963 needs a reassessment to enable the current African Union Charter assume a new focus in order to realize Agenda 2063 Development Agenda for the continent. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Africa needs our prayer and commitment to political and economic reengineering. There is hope as a continent 
through the various programs of the AU appears to be taking shape. More so, with all countries in the continent now fully independent, though with a few cases of struggles within countries for full liberation, everything appears to be on course. I would like to encourage distinguished personalities here present tonight to participate fully in this book launch in order to encourage this great Nigerian author. You have done well, and I wish you all the best. As for the rest of us in South Africa, this time has not been the best of times. But obviously, we need a lot of focus to solidify relations between Nigeria and South Africa at the interpersonal level. The two countries share similarities and are very important to the struggle for total economic emancipation of Africa. While we shall continue to pray for better coexistence between the peoples of our two countries, we must emphasize on the unity amongst our various associations in order to forge a greater impact in our collective march to take our two nations to, a, to the point of El Dorado and the spirit of, within the spirit of Ubuntu. As for me and my colleagues, we are here to serve, and we continue to do our best to serve our people in South Africa. I therefore appeal to all of us to understand with us and also with the government of Nigeria in the great task of nation building. Of course, we have challenges, but these challenges are not as much as our prospects as a great nation. I'm optimistic that this phase will soon be over. And I believe that as we march towards the collective greatness of our nations, we must, as individuals, assert ourselves in the way that will make things to work. I would like to close by saying that everywhere we are, life is, God is a God of purpose, and when purpose is not known, abuse becomes inevitable. If we know the purpose of our unity as a collective people in our nations, Nigeria and South Africa will work to make sure that the unity between these two countries will work for the good of all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. That was His Excellency Godwin Adama, the Consul General of Nigeria to South Africa.